Welcome everybody. Hi, Welcome, hi Cindy. Hi, hi, hi. Welcome Cindy. Cindy. Cindy Lawrence. Lawrence, right. The head of the the woman who runs the meth um museum. Can you believe it? Mo yeah. There is the a meth museum City. in New York City. Um what so is the meth museum? Yeah. The meth museum is a place where everyone can come, especially people who think they don't like math. And you will find a new way to engage. It's it's sort of like going to an art museum and seeing something beautiful. And you wouldn't expect to see that with math. But I promise you, and I hope you'll both come personally, that you will leave and say, I never knew math could be like that. But you know, when you hear the word museum, and when you like art, and you like to go to the museums, the last thing you think about is math. Right. And, or physics. And, and usually there's like divisions between people who like art and the people who like mathematics. Why do you think people are afraid of mathematics or they don't like it so much? I think that we have a problem in our society where we think that there is this division. You're either good at math or you're not good at math. There are people who are very gifted in anything. There are children that are very athletic more so than other children. There are children that are very good at drawing or painting more so than other children. There are children that are good at music that maybe can play a note, uh, play a tune by ear without ever having a lesson. But we would never say to our children, you can't take piano lessons because you're not as talented as that child who could do that without a lesson. Or you can't learn how to take um, art lessons, how to paint, maybe take a watercolor class because you weren't good at the beginning. Or you can't join a sports team because you can't get the ball into the basket or, or hit the ball with your bat. We say, well, if you practice, you can do any of those things. You want to be a concert pianist? We'll get you lessons. You'll work hard. You'll be a concert pianist. But for some reason with mathematics... But no kid is volunteering to get better in mathematics. Unless that's because it's not encouraged. We are not in, girls are not encouraged not to, to go in. Especially, especially a problem with girls. But So I will tell you, no child either volunteers, let's say, to learn how to play the violin when they realize that they have to hold the violin a certain way. They have to memorize how to read music. The beginning part is not fun. But why do children want to learn how to play the violin or the piano? Because at some point they heard music that they thought was beautiful and they want to learn how to make that music. MoMath exists to be the symphony of mathematics. If you come to MoMath, you see something beautiful and then you're inspired to want to do some of the basic work that you have to do to get to the point of being able to make more beautiful music or more beautiful mathematics in this case. But tell me, Cindy, what do you think? Why is it that uh, the society gives the math the crown of wisdom and they think if you're good in math, you're probably a genius. If you're good in something else, okay, but it's not the same. Why is it? And I will add to this that it used to be that I tech, I tech, uh, used to look for people who even came from liberal arts, but no more. Today, they are looking for people who has understanding of math. Uh, so it's- I, I think the problem is, is because of this, this situation that I mentioned, where we have this idea that you're either a math person or you're not, you're good in math or you're not. And many people self-identify as not being good in math, and therefore, when you see someone who is, you think that they're very intelligent, they're a genius, they're, they're very smart. And the fact is that there's nobody that can't be good in math if they aren't, mm -hmm. uh, if they are interested in spending the time to try. And it's like anything else. You might not be very good in baseball, but if you spend enough time with somebody throwing you balls and trying to hit with the bat, you will get better at it. And we just have this wrong yes, assumption. Maybe, maybe it's boring for some, and maybe there's no interest to, so to get better in it. it. And, and maybe um, learning how to memorize what it means when you see notes on a staff is also boring. But once you yeah, do yeah, that, yeah, you yeah, see, it, come on. Yes. There are very few things that cannot be presented to you. As yeah, a, but, it can be presented to you as intriguing, and interesting and it can be boring. Yeah, but now you're going to another problem because you need great teachers and not everybody is a right. great teacher. So, but, you know, but there's the assumption because I'll tell you going through the, the schools in the city, let's say. And, you know, we are, with kids, you go through schools. And I had um, few 
interviews or few um, visits and I was so surprised. But I know, I know what to expect, but still like, I remember once I went to a great high school and I won't give names here for anything. And uh, she asked me, um, what do you know? What do you want to know about math? I said, I'm sure you know what you're doing. I mean, I don't know anything about math, but if you, I'm sure you're a great school because that's why I came here and I like other things, but if the math is great, so that's good for everybody. And she said, well, what do you want to know? I said, I don't know even what to know. Yeah, to know and she said, ask. well, most parents or all parents care about the level of mathematics. I said, personally, I don't care. And she just kept, you know, pounding and hounding and, you know, and I said, I really, you know, I don't come here for math. I know what you do. Or in another school, they say, oh, our mathematics is great. And I, said, I asked the principal, what's the story with the math? She said, the parents want yes. math. Yeah. And then they had a teacher who said, every kid can be a genius in math. I said, okay, okay. Why is this need? What for? What, what does it prove? So I think the importance of math is that math is not just the arithmetic that we all think of when we hear the word math. Math is about problem solving and problem solving in a creative way. Wonderful. And you don't get that idea in school sometimes because the teacher right, you gives don't. you a problem and says, here are the steps, you do these steps, you solve the problem. It seems very rote and very boring. That, that's not what math is really all about. Math is really about thinking creatively and how could we do this or how could we solve that? You know, we all do math every day. If you have a bunch of errands you want to run today, later in the afternoon, you you're, probably already all the thinking, time. But you're probably thinking already, should I go here first or there first? What's the okay. order? I have five places to go. What order am I going to go so that I'm walking the least or getting home the fastest? That's a math yeah. problem right there. Yes. But so we all are... calculate all the time and we can be creative in so many ways, but there are many people who are not creative. It's... Uh... And I don't, I'm not sure that they learn mathematics will create. So, and, and this is where I, this is where I come back to comparing us to an art museum. I love to go to art museums. I don't go because I think I will become a great painter. I'm not going to be a great painter. Right. It's not a skill I have. And it's actually not even an interest I have to become a great painter. But I go to see something that inspires me, that makes me feel good, that I think is right. beautiful. And the same thing will happen when you right. come to MoMath. You may not want to be a mathematician. You may not want to learn any new math. And you won't feel like you are doing either of those things. You will feel like you are seeing things that are interesting and beautiful and inspiring. You didn't think about it this way, yeah. But you know, in New York Times actually last week had an article about research that the, it's that people are different if they are, uh, you know, more tend toward literature or tend more toward mathematics. Humani uh, reality. I don't know how to call it in in English even. Uh, you know what I mean though, right? And so some people are. You know, not, I I used to think that way also. I have three children and without naming any names, one of them was extremely gifted and talented in mathematics in a very early age, this was obvious. One of them was perfectly good in math, but didn't demonstrate any sort of outstanding ability the way another one did. And the last one I struggled to teach, and I don't mean the last one in order, just uh, three kids. And the third one, I struggled to teach how to add. And I thought, okay, this one is not a math mind. This one will be something else. If you look at all three of my kids today, they're all young adults. They're all, they all have degrees in a math or mathematical related field. They are all outstanding. Uh, they were outstanding students and they have careers in math aligned fields. You could not tell me which one was which. And you'd probably guess wrong if you guessed based on looking at what they do today. But, you know, at that time, I really did think that one of my children just wasn't good in math. And I was determined to at least help develop a basic competency. You have to know how to add at least. But, um, you know, and, I want and I, I was, you know, I, I've changed my view because I see that they all became extremely competent in mathematics, regardless of the fact. How it happened? What was the trigger? Where, what, what, when did they cross from, okay, in math? Uh, to not you know struggling even to add to being brilliant. Well, what what happened? 
It's your, your... You know, I think it's about looking at math as something that you play with and you enjoy that's fun. If, if you do any of the puzzles that are around, if you like the Wordle or the crossword puzzle or any puzzle, the Ken Ken or the Sudoku, you know, some are numeric and some aren't, but all puzzles require logical thinking and creativity. And you know that feeling when you put the last piece in a jigsaw puzzle, you're like, ah, I've solved it. I've done. Maybe. That's like a high. And that's what we try to share. But I want to raise something because I always wonder where is the line between if you can really teach creativity or it's, um, it's given and you can give tools to maybe create or trigger creativity. There's a very fine line between the two because I don't know if you can teach creativity, but I think you can give the tools to try to use another way. I, I will say, I never thought of myself as a good puzzle solver or a particularly creative problem solver. And, from, and I'm not a mathematician. So I should start by saying, I represent you both. I don't represent the world of mathematicians. My role was to translate, to take these great ideas that math mathematicians had for a museum and say, I don't get it. Explain it another way. How are we going to show this to people that aren't mathematicians in a way that they see what's exciting you and what you're I'm finding? Perfect you. manager, CEO. Yeah, you are. So, so with that, I will say that over the 10 years that this museum has been open, I have gotten much better at solving problems and thinking creatively from all the wonderful speakers and presenters we've had. Now, when somebody presents something, I'm a little better at it than I used to be. And so I think that anybody who spends time with something can become better at it. I'm not saying that there aren't people that are just amazingly creative, that I, I'm never gonna be that person, but everybody can become more creative or can appreciate the creativity that they see in others. You get people from low class, you know, like a, like a shelf, even, even homeless kids who are in shelter. Can so we get to those kids too and just pull we do we we have a program where thanks to the generosity of some donors we will bring uh title one schools or we will go out to title one schools and entirely for free not only do we bring schools from disadvantaged areas for free to the museum but we know the challenge is sometimes getting there it's not just here's free admission so we provide the bus, but not only do we pay for the bus, sometimes the challenge is the teachers aren't motivated. We do all the legwork. We actually book the bus. We bring the, the teacher has to bring the students outside the front of the school and the rest we handle, including lunch while they're in the museum. So we are able to do that to, thanks to the generosity of donors who support it. But the one question. Thing. I talked about kids and marginal kids and stuff like this, but you know, uh, it can, you know, coming to your museum or getting into the world that you are uh, opening can even uh, prevent Alzheimer. Well, we like Why to think you bring people from you know uh, old people to go. We back. also have seniors. We do. We have senior programs that are only for adults. We used to say that we're only for senior citizens, but we found that other adults were clamoring to come in as well. So now we just say, okay, these are adult sessions. Uh, mostly it's retirees. And I do think it helps keep your brain sharp to be yes. thinking about things uh, that are puzzles or that are creative. Right. And that's important at every age. Right. You mentioned something about girls. And I will tell you of my three kids, two of them are young women. And it's a particularly sad statistic in this country. Uh, research was done at the University of Washington in Seattle that showed that girls, by the time they're in first or second grade, have already been socialized to believe yes. that math and science are Absolutely. for boys. Me too. And this, Absolutely. Is, this is terrible. Yeah. And it's not genetic. And the reason I say that is because in Eastern European countries, it is the opposite. Right. Girls are socialized to believe that they are better, naturally better at math and science than boys. Right. And so there's something in our culture in this country, uh, which also is the, country, the Western the countries, Western countries. The all the world. Also Israel. The uh, it, it was world. clear for me that all the girls are uh, not uh, mathematic. No, don't go to those. Uh, Mathematics is for boys. Right. And so we are desperately trying to change that. And it's interesting. We have a program now, a fellowship program. We have 10 recent math graduates who are working in our museum 
Uh, and they're walking around the museum to talk to people like you who come into the museum and who say, well, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a math person. And they will find you and they will engage with you. And we took the 10 best candidates we have. And I am so delighted to say that five of them were men and five of them were women. And that was uh, very heartwarming to me. We didn't have to say, oh, it's all men. Let's find a token young woman to be part of this program. Literally, it was 50-50. And at the undergraduate level, we have made great strides. But at the graduate level, it's still mostly men. It's still mostly white men. And so as Wait, a so mathematical you know? community, we do have some work to do still. Well, you know, TB and I care for education. And from time to time, we bring somebody to talk about it. Because <laughs> education is one of the most important uh, um, pillars, you know, in our society, and we need to change all the time. The teachers that bring the kids to you, are they educated, you know, in the regular way, or they have progressive way, or you work with them to prepare them before they bring them to you, or how do you address it? So the teachers are just any teachers from anywhere. Some are interested in this creative kind of solving, uh, puzzle solving. But most of them, frankly, are sort of stuck with our state regulations and requirements. And so they are more or less teaching to the test. And that doesn't leave them a lot of time for creative right. ways to get kids excited. They're delighted to have a field trip and come to MoMath. And we do get letters. How do you call it MoMath? Field trip, MoMath. 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 Yeah. MoMA. 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 And we do, get, we do get letters from teachers after they've had a visit and they say it's been several weeks and our kids are still talking about this that they saw or that that they saw. One of our most popular exhibits is an adult sized tricycle that you can ride. It has square wheels. Now you think a square can't roll, but if you use math, there's a way to make it so that you can ride a tricycle with square wheels. These are these are fun things that kids remember that stick with them. And if a child has a further question, how did you know how to make this work? Well, you actually need calculus to solve that problem. So you kind of give a motivating reason for a child to go a little further in math and maybe take a calculus class because they're curious about how we solve that. If you know, I was I never cared for mathematics but I always liked geometric because it had yeah. I was drawing so I like to draw and so this was much clearer to me because you can see something and create but um math never never well I have a me. I have a real maybe it will backfire so when I went I was to university I studied music and sociology and my husband sociology and psychology but I started the year before him. So I waited a year, I took off uh, in order to be with him in the calculus class so I can copy in the exams. And I did. <laughs> I'm not, I'm a private tutor. There was no way, and I cannot explain it if it's psychological or socialization. I just couldn't know what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> well, so, I would say that calculus, and I mean, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, really I think know. that that's probably the fault of the educator, of the teacher. Sure. Not everybody learns the same way. So a good teacher might recognize that you learn through geometry. You're very visual. Let's talk about math through the lens of geometry. For somebody else, they're very symbolic. Let's talk about math with formulas and algebra. And one way doesn't work for every child or for every person. And so you will see a lot of different ways of connecting uh, with people in the museum. You really won't see very many numbers at all in the museum. You won't wow. see calculators. You won't see rulers. You won't oh, see graph paper. Right. You'll see a, a track you run back and forth on like you're in a video game. You'll see a cart that you ride over some bumpy shapes that turn out not to be bumpy, even though they look bumpy, a square wheel tricycle. There's a giant easel where you get to paint with mathematical symmetries. There's a sculpture studio where you can design 3D printed objects. So we're really trying to connect with people in ways other than the ways that they saw in their math classroom. Maybe I have a future. I, <laughs> I have to tell you something. When my kids were little, um, they asked me not to help them with homework in oh. math. Because Who asked you? The teachers, because I spoiled them with my old ways and they <laughs> them 
new ways. And then eventually they asked all the, the parents to come for lessons. And I said, I didn't like it then and I don't like it now and leave me alone. It's enough that they come. I don't care. That's why they go to you. You work for them. So it was like, it's, because then when they came home, I had no idea what they're talking about and yeah. what they're doing. Not only that I had to translate from Hebrew to English, so I screwed up everything and I said, just you're on your own. And then I, the, if you remember in kindergarten, they used to teach the math with small money, so with pennies, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So they, they used to, to play with the small money to understand the logic of math through money and calculations, whatever. And one of my boys didn't collaborate. So uh, the teacher told me, no, he doesn't do this. I said, listen, he's your kid, he's your student, handle it. You know, I have other things to handle with him. We came to school one day and, the, and both teachers stood there. And I said, here is the boy, talk to him. So they said, why don't you do the why don't you do what we ask he said i'm not dealing with small money <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like math and he calculates very well so it's really a very different way of looking at things and and i still think that the whole issue handling math is still beyond proportion in a way right. But uh, but I'm glad to hear that you have a great museum, and I really I, I really want both of you to come to the museum. Yeah. I really and, do. and I then we can have that uh, you're going to build one uh, together with Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv, in Tel Aviv yeah. which is very exciting. We're helping, yeah. Yes, so it's going to be going to have a, a math museum in Tel Aviv as well. You know, which uh, is interesting. I don't know, Marcy, you know, you mentioned now Tel Aviv, so you know I'm. I don't know what the connection, but you know, we have these special units in the army. One of them is like 8200. It's very well known. And everybody knows if you come to this unit, uh, when you finish the army, you are, You're that's it. For life. You are covered yeah. for life. Um, there is something that you have a feeling that only few people can reach this stage. But and too many are excluded, especially from, you know, from what we call periphery, from outside Tel Aviv or outside. No, 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 uh, but there is something else, CP, that happens today with this unit, because it used to be a uh, field unit that used to be the goal of the soldiers. And today there is this considered to be the unit, uh, the unit uh, group, because everybody knows that once they're there, professionally they're protected so basically what happens those who are good for math or uh, computers want to go there and all the rest needs to be in the field which creates a very different balance completely different from years ago and discrimination in, in and our society right but you can see what's the golden thing because it means money it means right. stability it means uh, but you know, but there is such a big difference, sorry to say that, and I think it's everywhere, from uh, the ability of kids, where they live, so how much they can get this kind of education that will lead them to this unit, but also how much their parents are wealthy, they can really prepare, and you know, it's people pay thousands and thousands to to prepare those kids to before they go to the army to be able to join those but units. this is something that our society is failing because uh, totally. once you create the private system against the public system and the public system is basically vic victims they victimize the public system and they create elite units not necessarily with good uh, stuff in it you know and i remember and this you know because it's painful on the road because I remember when I noticed that parents are preparing their kids at the age of five and six to do certain things just to be accepted right. or to be well accepted. Right. Even to kindergarten. And they give them the wrong, you know, the wrong idea. The whole, the whole side effects of what the system creates is all wrong so then you're busy in calculating what to do in order to come or to go or to stay and not really learning right and all, all the there numbers... needs to be you know i made a film three part um van Leer institute in jerusalem really 
uh, asked me to do it. Three part about um, special education. Who is sent to special education? So we went to those uh, settlements uh, in the south of Israel, which are considered to be not really developed, right? Mm -hmm. And I came, of course, with uh, somebody from the Van Leer Institute. And we were asking, the, so we talked with people uh, or kids who are in special education. And we gave them math questions. And they all knew how to answer them. How, wow. they ended, how they ended in a special education. And then we went to the street. And the moment you come with a camera, everybody comes, right? So we asked from all these people, who was in a special education? Most of them raised their hands. But I'm telling you, with the camera, and we have it, we just cannot broadcast it because it's children. It's only, right. it's only from the parliament, for the Knesset. People, kids who are intelligent and they understand math and everything are sent to the special education. They, they, are, they are transparent. Nobody really, they are, nobody sees them. Interesting. There yeah. Is, I, you know, children are naturally mathematical. Think about if you have your own children. Um, when they were kids, did they like to stack and sort and make groups of things? Here's all the red blocks and the right. blue blocks and the yellow right. blocks. That is all the very underpinnings of math mathematics. At its basic, math is the study of pattern. And so kids are very naturally curious and intelligent and like to play with things like that. And if you encourage that, you develop more mathematical thinking and mathematical capability. So um, there, are, there are lots of ways that we can improve, I think, people's attitude toward math at an early age. And it starts with coming to a place like MoMath where a child comes in and sees math as something that's fun and playful. Right. Because usually when a child sees math for the first time, it's symbols on a page in early elementary school. And if you don't get it, there's a feeling of inadequacy. There's a feeling of, I can't do this, a feeling of yeah, frustration. <laughs> and this stays, this stays with you for your life. Right. So this is why I tell people when they tell me they have new babies, I say at 18 months is when you should start bringing your child to MoMath because they will hear the word math and associate it with a place that is bright and col colorful, warm, fun. fun engaging and that's what you want them to think about with math and with their relationship to math and the other stuff okay there's some boring stuff you have to learn when you learn how to play music if you want to be a better ball player you have to get out there on the field and practice and similarly with math there's some boring bits that you have to get through but there is a reward on the other side and that's what we're trying to share with people is here's we'll some see, of the when we come to you and me we, we can judge whether we Something would open up and, and, and a burst I can't ice stain would come out of us, right? Yeah, wonderful. And then we're going to have another session like this, and we'll have the after math visit session. Right. And then you can, right. yes. Great. You can say uh, what you thought. Do you, do you have more uh, math, uh, MoMA, uh, MoMath uh, all over the United States or only in New York City? Only in New York. We do share our exhibits. Sometimes they travel around to other parts of the country. We started our life as a traveling exhibit, which traveled everywhere around the country. And ultimately when we opened the physical museum, I sold the traveling exhibit, which is still in the Science Center in Singapore. Oh. We are actually in many countries around the world now where we have sold some exhibits. The most recent one, I sold a square wheel tricycle to an educational institution in Kyiv in Ukraine. So we don't really know what the status of that is, unfortunately. Right. Um, but yeah, there's there is a growing interest in developing places like MoMath around the world. There are some math museums in other countries, but we are currently the only one that's open in the U.S. And Israel um, is a place where I hope there will be a museum a museum of math in Tel Aviv. Oh, yeah. 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 It's the Tel Aviv Foundation. No, okay. They do it. Too. No, no, they're very good. They're really yeah. very innovative and. Yeah, this yeah. is very, it's beautiful. So yeah. we'll come, we'll visit, we'll tell you, and then we'll talk about it. And we'll all be in the opening in, in Tel Aviv in yes, a few years, I there. hope. Yes. yes, I can't wait. Thank, Thank you. you so that much. Was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you as well. That's it. Okay, bye-bye. Right. Thank bye. you so much. Bye.